Greetings once again. It's your brother Spencer. And I want to present a simple message today on the gospel. See, many individuals use the term gospel. You hear the word gospel a lot and gospel is attached to a lot of things incorrectly today. So I want to take a little time out today to introduce the gospel biblically. See, I'm a salt preacher. And one of the characteristics of salt is to make one thirsty. I want you to thirst after knowledge, thirst after righteousness. And I'm going to go right into the scriptures. And I'm also going to give some scriptures that might be misleading or that individuals use to mislead about the gospel. But the gospel is, play, is spelled out in the Bible that we can all follow it, we can all obey it. And whoever believes in the gospel can be saved. And I'm going to go right into that. So I'm going to start right off at Romans 1. Right in Romans 1. And let me give you a little backdrop on Romans. Romans is a culture now that they're going into. Apostle Paul wrote the epistle. And he was the apostle to the Gentiles. This was a mixed nation now. Rome, it was, they were under Roman rule now. It was a Hellenistic culture. Meaning that all the culture of the Romans was taken from the Greeks basically. And now you have a conglomerate of culture, a freedom of culture, and Rome wanted to try to imitate through its Gnosis movement the perfect man. But the perfect man was Christ. So the idea of Romans, the whole theme of Romans is how can a man be justified? See, that's what we want. We want to be justified. We want to be in a right standing with God. So I'm going to go over a few Greek terms that we might have. That uh, we will be going over. Now I don't like to use Greek too much. Because I don't like to try to confuse anyone. Right? And I'm not trying to be puffed up. But the importance of the, using the Greek language. Is the Greek language had within it. Had things like mood. Tense. Gender. Uh, part of speech. That meant a lot of things. So words meant things. Okay? We would have words like such, such as belief. What does it mean to believe? Well, in English language, we might think, well, belief means, you know, and trusting in something. But it had a little more meaning in the Greek. So, Greek word for belief, there might be a several words for belief. For instance, the word for belief in the Greek is pistis. And that's one of the words that we want to look at more closely. And I'm going to go over that, and you can check behind me. You can go ask your pastor or go to your theological cemetery and find out what that word means and what tense it is, what mood it's in, and how is it saying, you know, is it a uh, prerogative or is it something that is uh, commanded? Is it is your objective? or What is it? So I'm going to go into this because Paul is writing to people that understood the words that he was saying. So again, we're talking about justification and we're going to talk about the gospel. Let's first define what the gospel is. What is the gospel? Now, I know that many of misleading teachers or teachers that just didn't know, when they talked about the gospel, they said, oh, well, the gospel's the good news. It's the good news. It's the good news. Yeah, well, it is the good news. And the word actually, gospel, means good and as pal means news. So combined together, it is the good news. But what is the good news? Like if I told you, oh, did you get the times today? Did you read the good news in there? You said, oh, uh, what good news? I can say there's good news, but you have to specify what the good news is. Okay? So let's get right into the scriptures here. Romans 1, and I want verse 15. I want to start at actually. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So Paul is about to preach what the gospel is. So there's no uh, debate, there's no misunderstanding. What Paul is about to present now is the good news or the gospel. But it's not just any good news. And Paul will get more specific into this. So let's go, and go on to verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everybody to believe, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So let's 
closely examine this scripture here. Because Paul lays out right here what the gospel is. And we have to understand what the gospel is. If you want to make your call and election sure, if you want to be able to dig deep into the scriptures, if you want to be able to increase your faith, you have to understand terms. You have to understand definitions. See, God wants you to diligently seek him. He doesn't want you to be an ignorant Christian. He wants you to thirst after him, to seek after him, diligently, diligently seek after him and his righteousness. Speaking of righteousness, that's another word that's defined in here. Righteousness, the word DK sune. DK sune is the word for righteousness. It's used many times in the New Testament. What is righteousness? Well, from the word right. So the state of right, but right in the sight of God, not in the sight of man. So in order for us to be right, which no man is, and Paul gets into that later, there's none righteous, no, not one. In order for us to be righteous, or back in the state that man was at in the garden, we have to be placed in that position. Now, can we do it through works? Can we do it through being good? Or is there something else, some other power that has to bring us to this point? This is what Paul is going to examine. He's going to break this down rhetorically. He's going to break this down like a scientist or a mathematician. He's going to break down how to believe in the gospel. How to be justified in God's sight. So let's break this scripture down. First, Paul says, for I am not ashamed. Now this word ashamed. Is a little different than the way we use the word shame. It's more or less meaning I'm not bashful. In other words, and this and this is going to come into play a little later in some of the scriptures I go to. I'm not bashful about the gospel. I'm not going to hide the gospel. That means if I believe in this, I'm going to show it. I'm not going to I'm not going to quell my belief in the gospel. I'm going to show it. See, if Paul was ashamed of the gospel, then the times that he was beaten, Lister and Derby. The times he was in prison, uh, when he was at Nero's chopping block, he would have said, oh, well, you know, it might be, Jesus might be the Christ, or he might have raised it. He, he might have shunned off. Just like Peter, actually, when Peter denied him. At that time, Peter was ashamed. He knew that he was the Christ. He walked with Christ. He handled Christ. He did miracles to him. He knew that was the Messiah. But Peter did not. Peter, at that time, was ashamed. Full revelation wasn't given to him as an apostle at that time. But Jesus prayed for him. And Jesus said, when you are restored, strengthen your brethren, see. And then he became not ashamed. And Peter later would be martyred because he wasn't ashamed. So Paul says, I am not ashamed. I am not bashful about. What? The gospel. There's that word. He is not ashamed about the good news. The good news that is sent to all mankind. And I know some individuals that get into this word cosmos and say, oh, no, it was only for the specific area that Paul was talking to. No. This message, the gospel, and look, this is especially for you Calvinists out there with your limited atonement theories. No. The gospel message, and I'm going to state this, the gospel message is for whosoever. Anyone on this planet. God is not out there selecting. Oh, you can make it. You're not going to make it. You're not. Now, God knows. God knows your heart. But God gives man free will. Else there wouldn't be love. See? Where there's liberty. Where there's love, there's liberty. You can't have bondage. You can't have someone force or something against your will. And it be, and, and be love. Just like if I put a gun to somebody's head and said, oh, you're you going to marry me. Well, the person might marry me because they want to save their life. But they don't actually love me because the love's not there. So where there's liberty, there's love. And that's where the spirit dwells, where there's love. God is love. So he's not forcing anybody, but he gives everybody the opportunity to accept him. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. All right. He's not ashamed of the gospel, but what gospel? He's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Christ. Now let's go into this word Christ or Christos. Or in the Old Testament, in the Syriac, it was the Mosiach, the Messiah. 
the same word, Christos, of the anointed one. I'm not ashamed of the good news of the anointed one. The anointed one is Christ. So Paul saying, I'm not ashamed that this is the Messiah. The one I'm proclaiming is the Messiah. And the Messiah has a plan that you might be justified. He goes over earlier in this chapter about by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And declared to be the Son of God. See, not declared as in he wasn't before. But we it's been revealed that he is the Son of God. He is our Redeemer. He is our Messiah now. See? And this is what Paul wants you to have faith in. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is. Now we have an analogy here. We have an equation here. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now he's going to get into, he told you the what. Now he's going to tell you why he's not ashamed. Why he's not a bastard. Why he can take a stand on this gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is. The gospel of Christ is. The power. That word power is translated. Is a Greek translated. Dunamos. The same word we use for dynamite. It's the power of God. So the gospel is the power of God. So I want to get a little bit into what the power of God. Now, I don't know the man or no man knows the scope of God's power. We can say what he is and we can say is that that's what's revealed to us. But it's hard for us to imagine one that is all powerful. Well, see, we try to put people up there. We try to make statues and we try to put uh, athletes and uh, 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 actors on a pedestal. But we can't really conceive on conceive what the power of God is. Because he's all powerful. And that's the first thing I want to go to. The power of God. God is omnipotent. It means he has all power. Not a little bit. He has all power. God is also sovereign. That means, basically, God can do what he wants, when he wants, and how he wants to do it. Just like, you know that bank that they have called Sovereign Bank? Well, that's what that bank is basically saying. You know how the bank, that Sovereign Bank, they can take money out of your account anytime they want to do. They, would, they can make prior, prior period transactions whenever they want to do. They can put money in there, take it out. They can erase transactions. They can do whatever they want, and they can charge you whenever they want. That's, that's what it means. It's saying, I'm the sovereign bank. We can do whatever we want to do. Well, the only one that truly is sovereign is God. Because God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and how he wants it done. That's the sovereignty of God. And God chose a way that man might be justified through him. Before the foundation of the world, he chose a way. A perfect way, because God can do nothing less than perfect. Everything God does is perfect. So God chose a perfect way to reconcile man back to God. And he showed it through the gospel. It's revealed through the gospel. So this is what the understanding of the power of God. It's just the power of the sovereignty, the omnipotent, and omniscience. All-knowing. God is all-knowing. God knows everything. You can't teach God nothing. If you could, who would be the one to teach him? See, by you doing something different, you're not educating God none. God knows the, from the beginning from the end. Because he was before Alpha and Omega. Before there was time, God was there. God is the ancient of days. He has no time. So he's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's sovereign. He's omnipotent. And that's just some of the attributes of God. So this power of God, this sovereign will, this all-knowing, of God is the means that God's going to use this through the gospel. God's going to use to justify man back to God. Now, I dare anyone to tell me, I know a lot of you think that you got dealt a bad hand or God's unfair to you. I want one person to write me and tell me that God is not just. How is God unjust? God is the perfect just God. He's perfect. There's nothing that God does is wrong. So Paul gets in here and he talks about the power of God being in the gospel. 
in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is revealed to us from the seed of David, declared to be the Son of God with power. He came with that power. Why? He brought the gospel unto us. He brought the gospel to all mankind that whosoever believe in that gospel will not be ashamed, won't be bashful of the gospel, won't hide the gospel. See, so let me stop and part right here because when we talk about whosoever believe, that word we're back to is pistis. That word pistis has mood in it, it has tense, and it has within it the imperative. That means it's the necessity. For one to move. See, your belief and your faith is connected. And this is what 99% of the pastors aren't teaching. You can't have a dead faith. Then James gets into that. You show me a dead faith, I show you somebody who doesn't have faith. A faith without works is dead. Now, can you work your way in? No. Paul's going to make the argument here that you're saved by faith only. You're saved starting with faith and God. Uh, justifies you through faith. It's all faith, but you still have a has have, have to have a faith that you're not ashamed. You have to have a faith that you move. Go into Hebrews 11. They call a faith chapter. Everybody move. Abraham by faith move. Uh, Jephthah by faith moved. Rahab by faith move. All of them did something. They weren't justified by that, but God knew their heart. See. Abraham believed God and it was counted on him or imputed to him for righteous. Why? God knew his heart from the beginning. It doesn't say, well, oh, well, Abraham didn't do anything. Of course he didn't, but God knew his heart. God knew he was ready to move. God knew that was a believing faith. Okay? God knows the beginning for the end. So God knew Abraham before he actually did anything. He knew that that was a faithful person and that was a believing faith. Even before he left his father's house, even though before he left the Chaldeans, he had a believing faith. Now, I said I want to get into this word belief because I'm going to have to stop and park right here. We're going to have to leave Romans 1 for a little bit and let's go into Romans 10 and do a little exegesis there because this is where a lot of the false prophets will take you. And look, let me state this first. The word of God is pure. The Word of God is clean, and there is nothing bad about the Word of God when it's rightly used. But if you use the Word of God wrong, you have a perversion of the gospel, and it is void. You void the gospel if I add or subtract to it. You shouldn't add to the gospel, and you shouldn't take away from it, because the minute you do, you corrupt it. Why? You add man in there. And what so many have done now is they've added to the gospel, and they've added to the word of God, and they made it void. So many people go into Romans 10. See, first of all, it's, it's, we're in this same chapter here. But people will, so-called preachers will run up to Romans 10 and say, all you got to do is believe. All you got to do is believe. And, you know, just like Satan, they misuse the word. They quote part of the scripture, but don't quote it completely, completely or misaccurately. Yeah, you only have to, all you have to do is believe. But that belief, again, pistis, is based on a faith that moves, a belief, a belief that moves, that's not going to sit dormant. That's going to see the a, a believing faith produces works. If you don't, if your faith doesn't produce works, then you have a dead faith. Now you're not working for your salvation, but a believing faith will produce works, and it always does. You can't name one person in the Bible that was faithful to God that didn't do anything. They just sat there and didn't do anything. Everybody in the Bible that was faithful and commanded to be faithful moved. So I want to stop right there, and I want to go to another scripture real quick. Let's go in and talk about this believing faith. Let's first go into uh, the book of John. John uh, 2, I want to go to John 2 and 23, verse 23, and we're talking about that word pistis again, that belief. Now, here's, let me uh, set the scene, scene for you. This is Jesus Christ, right after he came from Cana Galilee, and he turned the water into wine. So, he did a miracle in front of all the people, the Jews. And let's see what happened after he did that, made, made that miracle.
Let's see what happened. Verse 23. Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. So that's the word. So your pastor says, all you have to believe, whosoever shall believe, any kind of belief works, as long as you believe, then you're saved. At that moment, you're saved. Well, this scripture here says that many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did, when they saw him turn water into wine, when they saw him performing the miracles, they believed. But let's read on verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. But Jesus didn't commit. Why? Because Jesus knew that that faith that they had was not a believing faith. See, that wasn't that strong pistis, that persuasion faith. See, they knew that, hey, there's something, something with this man. Uh, but they didn't trust him as the Messiah. And Jesus knew this from the beginning. Let's read on. Let's go on to uh, skip over to chapter 3. We're going to see the same thing. Nicodemus. Now, you, this is familiar, but no one ever attacked it from this sense of believing. Nicodemus. Now, let me give you a little background on Nicodemus. Was a Pharisee, which was the straightest sect in the Jewish religion. They had many sects, the Sadducees, Pharisees, the scribes. The straightest sect, or what you would call the Orthodox sect. The ones that were masters in the law, the Pharisees. Now, this point, man, Nicodemus, wasn't only a uh, Pharisee, but he was a ruler in the faith. That means he was deep in the doctrine. He thought he'd do something. He was a religious person. He was a Jew. He was circumcised the eighth day. He was the seed of Abraham. But let's see what kind of belief he had. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. See? The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God. You see that right there? Nicodemus knew. He told Jesus, just like you said, all you have to do is believe and confess. And he confessed. All you have to do is believe and confess, right? When Nicodemus called him rabbi or teacher, we know. In other words, he acknowledges it. We know that you're a teacher that come from God. He knew all that. Was he saved? Nope. Because Jesus would cut him right off. Let's see. Let's read on. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. The same as the Jews at the Passover. They believed because of the miracles. But they didn't believe him to be the Messiah. They didn't have a saving belief. Let's read on. Jesus answered and said to them. Look, and this is Jesus. Jesus didn't say, oh, well, you're saved now. Or you in. Or, or let's take the 16-week Bible course. Uh, or start paying tithes now. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, oh, well, just enter in. You don't have to be baptized. Or be baptized for an outward sign of inward grace. Now be baptized for an outward sign for inward grace. Show everybody else that you believe. He didn't, he didn't say that. This is what he said to him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So at that point, even though Nicodemus knew that he was someone that came from God, even though Nicodemus believed, he didn't. He didn't have a belief that was saving. So with that said, Let's go into your scripture, your pastor's favorite scripture, and I know you heard this one, and you probably can quote this to me. Romans 10, and because my time is short, I'm going to skip down to verse 8. Now again, Paul talking to the Romans, and now he's made an argument at this point. Remember, we started talking about justification in, in chapter 1. Now, what... Will your pastors do, and I'm going to just go, I'm, I'm trying to meet you where you're at, because you'll take me right to Romans 10 and say, oh, this is how I'm saved. But you skip all the verses, all the chapters before uh, Romans 10, and you go right to this with no understanding. And what I'm trying to do as the salt preacher, I'm trying to give you an understanding. I'm trying to wet your mouth with a little salt water so you continue to thirst after pure water, after pure knowledge. So, but I'm going to meet you right where you're at. And I'm going to explain the scripture to you in the correct way. Now, Paul's talking to Israelites. He's talking to the church. True Jews. 
Jew, now Jews in the body of Christ that have obeyed the scripture. Go back into Romans 6 and 2. The same chapter, Romans 6 and 2. They were all, all baptized. Romans 6 and 3, excuse me. Romans 6 and 3. All these were baptized into the faith, into Christ. But now he's saying, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel. Israel, the seed of God. That they might be saved. So all Israel wasn't saved. That they might be saved. For I bear them record. They have a zeal for God. But not according to the knowledge. For they being ignorant. And we sought out their own righteousness. See? Just like some of you are doing. Seeking out your right. It can't be that way. I don't have to be baptized. I don't have to go to that church. I don't have to be a part of Christ's church. I can be a part of the Pentecostal church. I can be a part of the Lutheran church. See, so you're seeking out your own righteousness. But my hope for you is that you might be saved. Now, let me wrap this up because my time is going. And you're going to have to see part two to get a full understanding of the gospel. Because I didn't finish. And before you write and comment, I implore you, I beg you to please listen to part two. So that you can get a full understanding of the gospel. I'm going to stop off at Romans 8 and I'm going to go through. Romans 10 and 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh to thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith. Again, that word back again. Your faith. Your persuasion. Your A peace. Your A peace is going to bring you into your righteousness. The righteousness of God. Dike sune in the Greek. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. The Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God had raised him in the dead, from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And you say, that's how I'm saved, without doing anything. But you have to get more of an understanding of that scripture. Now what is the gospel again? He starts off with faith, and faith in Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everybody who believes, to the Jew first, and also Greek. But then he goes on. For therein, in there, in the gospel, is the power of God revealed from faith to faith. Backy 2.4 says, and he quotes that, the just, those that are justified, shall live by faith. Brother Spencer, Lord be willing, I'll be right back with another message.